Hello and welcome back to Dragon December here on the Arcane Forge and to another Monster Monday, a series where I draw a creature from D&D and I talk about its lore and its history and what it's like to fight. And these videos are based on your suggestions which you leave me down in the comment section below and there has been absolutely no shortage of people wanting to see me draw and talk about dragons in general but also about today's topic about metallic dragons. If you joined us last week where I was talking about the chromatic dragons and the origins of dragons in general in terms of their real world lore and mythology you may have heard me mention that there are three types of dragons. Chromatic, which we covered last week. Metallic, which is the topic of today's video. And the crystalline or gemstone dragons. And of the three, metallic dragons are the good aligned dragons in general. At least in terms of the in-game lore, the in-game sort of concept of these dragons in Dungeons and & Dragons. And that's been the way things have always been since they were first released. The first metallic dragons were introduced alongside the chromatic dragons in 1974's White Box set. But rather than having the expansive breadth of metallic dragons that we have access to in 5th edition, in 1st edition the only metallic dragons were golden dragons. The remaining metallics only joined D&D through the 1975 release of the Greyhawk supplement. In subsequent editions of D&D we had access to all sorts of metallic dragons and in 5th edition, although there are a plethora of metallic elements that we could potentially choose from, the metallic dragons that we have access to are the classic golden ones, copper, brass, bronze and silver. Now, today, while I talk about the lore of these creatures, I'm going to be drawing a silver dragon, and that is because that's what my patrons over on Patreon have voted for. If you're new to the channel, or just didn't know, what I tend to do with these videos is that I take your suggestions that you leave me down in the comment section below, or however you want to reach me through email or through one of my social media pages or channels. I bundle up every single one of those suggestions, and then I add it to a draw list, which I then give to my patrons over on Patreon, who every month get a chance to vote on which monsters they'd like to see me draw in what order. So essentially, they take your ideas, and then they get to hand pick which ones they want to see me draw in what order. And everybody gets an equal vote whether they tip me the price of a cup of tea every month for making these videos all the way up to the very very highest levels. And of the metallic dragons they were really really enthusiastic about seeing a silver dragon which is what we are going to be drawing today. So if that sounds appealing to you, if you like the idea of A helping me to make these videos for you every single week and sending me a tip for making this stuff, and B if you like the idea of having more control over the content that you see from me, I'd urge you to head over to Patreon and help us out because we have a really lovely community growing there and also this is an absolute dream for me to get to do and I can only make these videos with your continued support. As a thank you I like to give people rewards at different levels so you don't just get a vote you also get things like shout out on all my social media at certain levels, copies of every single illustration that I do each month including this one and also all of the other dragons that I'm planning to draw during Dragon December, private live streams and things like one-on-one -on -one chats. We can talk more about dragons, about your campaigns, I can illustrate your characters and things like that during our discussion or just chill out and chat. But anyway as I say, my patrons voted to see a silver dragon out of all the metallic dragons today, so that's what I'll be covering. Now the first thing to note about metallic dragons is that the monster manual in 5th edition mentioned that although metallic dragons are good aligned and more nurturing the mortal races of the world than their chromatic counterparts, good dragons recognize human bloodlines by smell alone and will judge each person that they meet by the actions that they can remember their ancestors performing, including century spanning grudges if slighted, or in intense emotional and immediate friendships on site if they were treated well by someone's ancestors because metallic dragons have an almost perfect memory. And that reminds me of last week when we talked about white dragons. White dragons have the same sort of perfect, unfaultable memories. And they're also the sort of primordial, savage, wild dragons of the chromatic dragons. It got me thinking if perhaps the first species of dragons that existed in this world, depending on how you view the lore and things like that, might have been white dragons. And that all subsequent dragons have evolved from this precursor species. Maybe white dragons are actually like proto-dragons, the first things. Those that evolved shiny scales, perhaps retained the memory properties of their white kin, developed further into other forms of metallic dragons, and some took on the savage and wild traits, the aggressiveness of the white dragon, casting aside its perfect memory in favour of more, in more intelligence, and evolved into the other chromatic dragons that we know, because when you shoot a bee of white light through a prism, it refracts, splits up into all of the colours of the rainbow. So my personal little headcanon here is that perhaps white dragons were the first types of dragons, and all subsequent dragons evolved away from that. The only link we can see is that things like silver dragons or platinum dragons look a little bit close to white as a metal. They also have this shared perfect memory, and colours diverge from white if split through a prism. But that's just an idea, I guess. The main similarities between metallic and chromatic dragons, aside from their general reptilian six-limbed 
appearances are their mutual propensity to hoard treasure and artifacts. However, whereas a chromatic dragon may hoard stolen treasure, or even slaves in the case of things like the green dragon, the metallic dragons are inherently fascinated and curious when it comes to mortal species and they seek actually to preserve and protect them, they're actually enamoured with the ingenuity and progress and potential that the mortal races command. As such, the treasures that they hoard tend to be forgotten relics that inspire nostalgia in these ancient beings. Things like magical artefacts from battles where they fought alongside old, long-dead friends whose memory brings them joy, or inventions created by brilliant mortals that they tend to tinker with over the millennia and discover their mysteries, only furthering their amazement in these creatures' lives. I tend to view the personalities of metallic dragons, although they vary from species to species, as a bit like Arthur Weasley in the Harry Potter series. In the Harry Potter novels, Arthur Weasley is charged with exploring and documenting muggle, non-magical people's technology, which he revels in, he's obsessed with, even if he doesn't fully understand all of their purposes. For example, his quest and amazement to find the purpose of a rubber bath duck. But with this apparent innocence and curiosity aside, metallic dragons are no less powerful or deadly than their chromatic cousins. In fact, in some cases, they may even be more so. They, in their desire to understand mortals, have perhaps learned from the more inventive creatures of the world. Whereas chromatic dragons are forces of nature and full of destructive potential, the idea of magical wrath made manifest, metallic dragons have learned to harness their magical forces in more intricate ways, and usually, as a result, have access to multiple breath attacks rather than just one as well. Well, all metallic dragons have the ability to shapeshift into other creatures, a feature that most use to live among mortals, to experience the pleasures of their lives, and to observe and learn from their ingenuity. A skill that chromatic dragons would find abhorrent, viewing all creatures, even other dragons of the same species or perhaps other colours, as lesser beings. Now, as I've mentioned before, just like the chromatic dragons, metallic dragons come in a variety of forms and each vary wildly. I've mentioned that in 5th edition we have brass bronze, copper, gold, and silver dragons, but 80% of the periodic table of elements are actually metals. So although we only have details for a few of these creatures in the monster manual, and there are loads of homebrews and other classes of metallic dragons in other editions, there's no reason why in 5th edition we couldn't have something like a mercury, lead, cobalt, uranium, iron, plutonium, or potassium dragon that you could put in your own world. If you have done anything like that, please make sure to let me know. I would love to hear your ideas for metallic dragons, especially if you've already homebrewed them or if you know where other viewers could find stats for these creatures. It'd be really interesting to see what the community has come up with, so make sure to leave links to those down in the comment section if you know any other metallic dragons for 5th edition. In terms of the ones that we do have for 5th edition though, brass dragons are characterised by these large shield-like crests on the sides of their heads and the great sort of fan-like wings that join the length of their entire body. They prefer desert environments in which to make their lairs because they're enormously isolated locations. But despite this, brass dragons are the most charismatic and actually the most talkative of the metallic dragons, craving conversations and spinning elaborate tales. They revel in the florality of language, the sounds of words, and the intricacies of speechcraft. As such, the treasure that they hoard and covet are actually centred around long-lasting magic items that help them communicate with other species. Items perhaps with their own intelligence, or perhaps magical instruments of some kind or another, played by great storytellers, books written by verbose scholars. For them, meeting kindly adventurers immediately calls for a celebration, a feast and a campfire around which to tell stories. A campfire that they can innately produce with their fire breath, which, much like last week's purple dragon, travels in a line, burning all things in its path, unlike the red dragon's more cone of fire breath. But it seems that brass dragons have also mastered the art of talking at such length that they can bore their guests unconscious, or perhaps they maybe just want to use their sleep breath attack that knocks out anyone who fails a constitution saving throw in front of them. Bronze dragons actually prefer coastal habitats and regularly transform into creatures like dolphins so that they can follow and observe ships headed to war. They, unlike the more chaotic brass dragons, are lawful good and are weirdly fascinated with warfare and the glory associated with fighting for a just cause. They seem to have personalities much more like a kind of idealised version of Vikings who saw glory in battle, or at least a battle well fought, and like to regale each other with their victories and stories of struggles and this kind of idea of Valhalla, an after 
afterlife of constant conflict, where one would hone one's martial prowess against the greatest fighters throughout all of history for all eternity. But bronze dragons despise tyranny and regimes that strive to harm their occupants. Instead, they will fight with furious abandon for peace, justice, freedom, and liberty. Sounds kind of like the murica of metallic dragons. We want you to fight alongside a shining, fire-breathing dragon of justice. Hooey! These flying freedom engines tend to have more beak-like mouths as well, making me think if I drew them, I would definitely have a bald eagle on my list of reference images, as long as that idea isn't bludgeoning you over the head already. And they make use of a devastating lightning breath attack, which if I was putting one of these creatures in my game, I would now almost certainly homebrew into a laser of red, white, and blue, maybe just a stream of fireworks. They also have a repulsion breath attack, which rather than making people very, very sick, is actually a huge cone of force that knocks an opponent and loose objects away from the dragon. These dragons actually take the fewest trophies of their kin as a horde, generally adorning their lairs with things like pearls and elaborate coral or shells that it nurtures when it's home on shore leave. Copper dragons are what the monster manual calls calls pranksters, or joke tellers, or perhaps riddlers, but no one will ever really probably know how talented they are at any of these skills, because if a 64 foot dragon with acid breath is telling you a joke, you're under a lot more pressure to nervously laugh than if your dad is making a terrible pun. And this actually often leads to disaster. The Monster Manual actually mentions that they are the most quick to anger of their kin, which can happen if someone doesn't laugh at one of their jokes, so it seems like although they value hospitality more than the other metallic dragons, they are also essentially holding you hostage with bad one-liners until you can escape to safety. Copper dragons live to screw with people too, hoarding vast supplies, precious raw materials like gold and silver, while frequently misleading treasure hunters. The monster manual says that, quote, it might send curious treasure hunters on a wild goose chase to search for an object while it watches them from afar for its own pleasure. The monster manual also says that the friendship of a copper dragon is a treasure itself to be coveted, but to be honest, I think they're really, really not not sold the experience as even remotely pleasant. These creatures also have a slowing breath attack, so a cone of inconvenience, which is just the most annoying feature. So friendship with a copper dragon is a hard, hard pass from me. Gold dragons are said to be the most potent and deadly of the metallic dragons. They're often the most righteous as well and noble of the metallics, destroying evil wherever they find it. Dwelling mostly in ancient ruins on isolated islands, they prefer to keep themselves knowing that their presence instills fear in mortal creatures of the world, unlike copper dragons, despite their kind dispositions. Gold dragons eat mostly hard gemstones, crystals, and pearls, although that's not their hoard, that's just their meal. Instead, they construct elaborate, safe-like lairs that they secrete away in hard-to-reach places, and stored within are the relics of evil creatures that they slay. They see themselves as guardians of these baleful objects, a last stand against those who would do harm. To them, their solitude is a noble sacrifice, and they are an eternal, and they're on an eternal mission to protect those who can't protect themselves, not for glory or notoriety, but for the still, quiet satisfaction of doing the right thing and protecting the world from evil artifacts. This sort of quest-like attitude, although affording them plenty of time to reflect on their lives and the nature of reality itself, is not solely just a marker of wisdom. It also comes with the cost of these creatures being incredibly aloof and superior. Their charisma basically drops as a result of not being in contact with many mortal creatures. Their breath attacks are a flaming cone like a red dragon, but also a weakening breath that causes those affected to have disadvantage on strength-based skills. The silver dragons are the kindest and most amicable and friendliest of their kin, and embody the gentler side of the metallic dragons. Almost to the point of naivete, they crave the company of others, and are the most likely of all of the metallic dragons to use their shape-shifting powers to live among mortals that they admire. But due to their lack of understanding in the mortal species, they tend to dwell in isolated, frozen mountaintops, ideally in abandoned things things like wizard towers or ruined cities where they can spend decades learning about the ingenuity of these creatures that they admire without committing any social faux pas that a shapeshifter might tend to in a society that they're intrinsically unfamiliar with. In their citadels, they collect items of significance, books and scrolls and documents detailing things like the fantastic histories of short-lived races, and the shorter the lifespan, the better for a silver dragon. They seem less interested in the lives of elves, for example, whose lives are more close in 
lengths to their own, but shorter-lived races, like humans, absolutely fascinate them due to their zest for life, even with such a short amount of it. If threatened, they're well-equipped to obliterate their foes, or the foes of the friends that they manage to accumulate over the years, with a cone of devastating frost, or a paralyzing breath attack. But silver dragons, being kind-natured, would always prefer to scare their foes away, rather than slaughter them. Now, in terms of the design choices that I've made for this dragon here, I like the idea of giving my metallic dragons kind of dagger-like feathers and large feathered wings. I've also given the silver dragon here these kind of long band-like horns, whereas I tend to like to give dragons horns in general. I thought making this thing seem kind of angelic looking, with almost like halo-like horns and these long feathery wings, but also keeping the feathers nice and, nice and jagged, keeping things nice and angular and sleek, to emphasize the fact that everything's made out of metal here, just to really drive home the fact that these creatures, rather than their sort of almost demonic looking traditional chromatic dragon cousins, are good aligned and serve good ends by making them look almost celestial. It's not what these creatures traditionally look like. They usually look, you know, like shiny regular dragons with traditional reptilian wings, which I totally get. I think part of the fun of these creatures for some people is to have players not totally know whether they're fighting a good or a bad dragon if they're not too familiar with the concept of chromatic versus metallic dragons. They might just see a dragon and go out and attack this thing, only for it to be revealed that this is a kind and thoughtful and talkative dragon, you know? But I like making this distinction. Uh, dragons are rare enough in all the worlds that I tend to write. I think players need to have a tiny bit of a break. If they see a massive dragon, don't have to go and destroy it immediately or be destroyed by it, rather. Also, thinking about dinosaurs, these other massive reptiles having been discovered to have feathers and things like that. I think this really suits the metallic dragons. I really like the drawing that I made today. And I hope you did too. If you did, make sure to leave a little like down below, perhaps favourite this video, and share it with other members of communities that you might be a part of, maybe your D&D group, something like that. Anything that you can do like that really, really helps this channel to grow and helps YouTube know if I'm doing a good job or not, as we're still only a little growing dragon hatchling, little wormling. So I'd really appreciate your help if you did enjoy the video. So until next time, I hope you are valiant and noble enough to befriend all the metallic dragons that you find. I hope you join us on Friday, where I'll be talking about yellow dragons, another one of my missing chromatic dragons, and if I don't see you until Monday, then happy monster hunting until then.